All right. Everybody say, God's got this. Dear church, God's got this. Whatever you're facing right now, God's got it. God's not surprised by your problem. He's not surprised by your circumstance. He's not surprised by what's going on with your parents or with your children or with your financial situation. God's got this. Just squeeze someone's hand and say, God's got this. God's got this. When I first stepped in as pastor, I was 28 years old that week. I was overwhelmed. I was just completely like feeling so insecure and worried and not sure where the church was going to go, not sure if people were going to come back the following week. I was like, they don't like me. I'm not like my dad. I'm not, definitely not like my mom uh, because I'm a guy. And, you know, I was thinking about all of these things, and I was, I was turning it all into as if this thing was leaning on me. And I called this pastor. I said, I'm really overwhelmed, and I, I'm really concerned about the future. And he said, Paul, who's the head of the church? I said, Jesus, is this a trick question? Is it, it's Jesus. He goes, if Jesus is the head of the church, then we're all good. If he's not, we're toast. And he said, don't you remember what Colossians chapter one says? So I want you to go in your Bible to Colossians chapter one. Yes. We look at this son and we see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this son and we see God's original purpose in everything created for everything, absolutely everything above and below. Keep going. Visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels. Everything got started in him. Everybody say in him. In other words, he's saying everything is in him and everything finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence. You are not God's first rodeo. Your situation is not God's first encounter to try to fix that problem. He's been doing this for a long time. He was there before any of this came into existence, and he holds it all together. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got you and me, brother. Come on. You guys sound good this morning. He's got you and me, brother, in his hand. He's got the whole world. All right, I won't make us sing the rest of it. Y'all like, how long are we going to go with this? <laughs> But this is what Paul was saying to the church because the church was kind of freaking out. They weren't sure what was going to happen. I mean, there was, there was bad leaders going on during that time that were harming a lot of the Christians. There was martyring. There was all kinds of stuff happening to the church. Persecution, suffering. God never promised us a storm-free life, a pain-free life, but he did promise to be with us through the midst of any trial or circumstance we face. And so Paul was saying, dear church, he's been holding this all together up until this moment, and when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like the head does a body. Don't lose your head. God's got it. He was supreme in the beginning. He was leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything and everyone. So spacious is he. So roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe. All the people and things and animals and atoms they all get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of his death. Yes, his blood poured out from the cross. Church, what I'm trying to say is God's got this. God's got this. So this morning I was driving to church and my five-year-old boy, he was being very rambunctious and rowdy and energetic and I was trying to focus on my sermon and I'm praying in the spirit and he's like, daddy, what are those words? And he's asking me a thousand questions and I literally was like, Jesus, take the wheel. And I felt like God was just reminding me, Paul, I got this. I got this. I remember when we first stepped in as pastors, our first child at that time, he was eight months old, and, um, and I was so 
like ready to see him take the next step in his journey of, of humanity, being able to start crawling, right? Being able to start moving across the floor. When he first started crawling, I was so excited. I had my you know, phone out. I was fitting. I was like, look, he's crawling. He's crawling. And then a few months later, he took his first step. And I was like, ah, he's walking. And I'm crying. And now when our next kids have walked, I just haven't captured it all on video. But I think about how sometimes we get worried about how things are going to happen, when things are going to happen, if things are going to happen. We forget God's got this. He's got you. He's got your kids. He's got your business. He's got your dreams. He's got everything that he's put in your heart. I remember when my father passed away and I was so concerned about the future of the church. I was concerned about whether we were going to have to close the doors, if we were going to keep the school open, the college, the camp, the dream center. Here we are 10 years almost since my father passed away and the church is still strong and the school is still open and the college is still going and the dream center is still reaching people and we've launched more campuses and the camp is still reaching kids every summer. I don't understand, but God's got this. I can't figure it all out, but if I worry about everything, I'm going to miss out on what God wants to do. And some of you right now, you're worried about your future. You're worried, man, how am I, how am I going to pay for college? How am I going to pay for my kid's college? Is my husband, is he ever going to get right with God? Is my wife, is she ever going to get healed of that sickness? Are my kids ever going to get back in church? Are they ever going to get out of this season of immaturity? Is this ever going to work out? And you need to remind yourself, just put your hand on your heart right now and just say, God's got this. God's got this. I remember I was traveling with my band back in the day, and I had a Christian rock band, and I was, I was the front singer. I played guitar, and I thought this morning I'd show you one of those songs. And I remember we were playing for, like, you know, groups of, like, 30, 40, 50 people all over. And, uh, hey, don't laugh. It's not like you had a cool rock band. You're like, 30 people. Yeah. Check one. All right, there we go. And I remember um, the band, they were very, you know, very like insistent that I had to wear these little in-ear headphones because the in-ears kept me in track and sync with the drummer, right? So the drummer would kind of set the beat, right? So the drummer would, you know, set the beat like boom, boom. And as long as I had my in-ears in, I was in sync with the drummer. But sometimes I would get so excited in a song, I would rip out the in-ears and I'd be like, yeah, 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 And all of a sudden, like, I'd start going down my own path that was out of sync, and the whole band would just stop playing behind me and just stare at me. <laughs> and they would mouth words to me like, You know, and they were like, get the in-ears back in. You got out of sync. They would stop playing. So it was embarrassing. I'd be out in the front. And I'd be like, where, where are you guys at? Y'all with me? And they were like, no, we're not with you because you got ahead of us. And I think it's the same sometimes with God. We get frustrated because other people are getting married and we haven't gotten married yet. Other people are having kids and we haven't had our kids yet. Other people's ministries are taken off. And we haven't seen our breakthrough yet. So I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a bunch of followers. And I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to take this into my own hands. And I'm going to control everything because I've got this since God doesn't got this. Stop taking the in-ears out. Stay in sync, my friends. God's got your dreams and your promises. If you'll just trust him, he's going to make it come to pass. God's got this. God's got this. Right? And I think about how... The disciples, I'm going to switch mics. The disciples, they were on the boat with Jesus in Mark chapter 4. If you got your Bibles, you could turn there. Mark chapter 4. And here they were. They were going to the other side. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Let's go on a ministry trip. They're all with Jesus. Everything seemed fine until the storm showed up. And it wasn't just any kind of storm. It was a bad storm. It was like a hurricane that showed up. And they start freaking out. And they're like, What's going on? Where are you, God? I thought you were with us. I thought you were going to deliver us from all of our trouble and our pain and our suffering. And sometimes we act like this as the church. We run around like chickens with our heads cut off. Right? We're like, ah, there's another recession coming. What are we going to do? And, uh, and we can unintentionally 
take matters into our own hands, right? We can, we can get into two ditches. One ditch is you try to do it all by yourself. You just power through and you're like, I got this. I'm going to figure it out. I'm in control here. And that's not good. You're like, I'm going to confess my way through this situation. I'm going to possess the land through my own strengths and charisma. And I'm going to push my promotion with the boss. You do that. It's not going to turn out well. Then we get into this other ditch of we're so afraid. We just want to bury our heads in the sand. I don't even want to look at it. I don't want to pay attention to it. I want to pretend like it's not there. There is no storm. I'm just going to imagine there's no problems. There's no situation. There is no cancer. There is no sickness. I, I don't even want to look at it. Paul, don't even say the word cancer in church. Don't even say recession. You're scaring me right now. I'm leaving. And I preached a sermon recently called Face It. Everybody say Face It. Face It. Not with your own power and your own control. Don't run from it. Listen, the church is not called to cower back when Goliath shows up. We're called to walk straight towards that giant and say, my God is bigger than you. My God is stronger than you. And even though I look small and even though I'm young and even though I don't have a Ph.D., I just believe that God's got this, that God's inside of me and he's going to get me through this. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The disciples, though, they were freaking out. They were scared. Because they couldn't control the storm. They couldn't control the situation. Have you ever faced something that you couldn't control? It was out of your control, five of us in the room. <laughs> this is the disciples. It's out of their control. And watch what happens in verse 38. Jesus was in the stern, and he was sleeping. I don't have a cushion, so I'm just going to put my head here. Jesus was on Labor Day. Ah. <sighs> They're all working on Labor Day, and he's just resting. He's like, <sighs> and they wake him up from his sleep, and he's totally relaxed. And they go, what are you doing? Look, verse 38, they said, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care? We're going to die. And he gets up, and he rebukes the wind, and he says to the waves, quiet, be still. They didn't realize that Jesus was resting, not because he was lazy, but because he knew the power that was inside him. You can rest when you know God's got this. I'm not saying you don't do your part. We do do our part. But if you haven't taken a nap in a long time because this thing's been keeping you up at night, you haven't been able to sleep well. Did you know the night that Peter was arrested before he would stand trial in front of Felix? It says he was sleeping in the prison cell. Now, this was the same Peter that couldn't sleep during the storm. But after he saw what his teacher could do in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a circumstance, he learned years later, there are certain things that are out of my control. So instead of staying up all night with worry and fear and paranoia and ripping out the in-ears as if God doesn't care about my life, I'm going to stay in sync. I'm going to sleep tonight. And when you go to sleep, God goes to work. I'm talking to somebody this morning that needs to know God's got this. Some of you are facing things right now with your children, with your dad, with your mom, with your son, with your daughter, with your husband, with your wife that are just, you're going, God, could you fix it right now? Like, I know that you at some point are going to solve this, but I need it solved right now. We are a microwave generation serving a crockpot God. And God's like, chill. I got this. It may not happen on your timeline, but if you try to get ahead of me, did you know Abraham, he was promised by God that he would have children. And he was believing that until his wife said, I don't think God's got this. <laughs> and I think you should sleep with my maiden. He was like, I'm a team player. If you say so. <laughs> hey, it's in the Bible. Don't get mad. It's in the. There are flawed stories in the Bible from flawed people. But the story of God is not flawed. God still moves through people that made mistakes. So Abraham, he takes out the in ears and he gets ahead of God. And he gets ahead of what God was trying to do, and they have a baby. And the baby was named Ishmael. But God had promised him a baby that was a promised baby. And God still showed up and gave him that promise through Isaac. Can I tell you that even when you make mistakes, even when you try to get ahead of God, you try to jump into a relationship, you try to jump into a, a situation, you try to promote yourself, you try to do this out of selfish ambition, that God is so good that he knows how to override your mistakes, override your impatience, and he still shows up. But we've got to stop trying to take matters into our own hands and believe that God's got this. 
Who or what is causing you to question if God's got this? What's driving your life? What's driving your sense of rest or your sense of peace? Is it fear or faith that's setting the pace in your life? Is it worry or worship that's setting the tempo to your song? Is it the pressures of people or the prince of peace? What's causing you to rush the process? What's causing you to try to get ahead of God? Is it paranoia that's driving you every day? Or is it prayer that's driving you every day? You know, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter four, he said, Dear church, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through supplication and prayer, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Listen, what Paul was saying, church, stop acting like God doesn't have this. Let your request be made known to him and stop worrying and stop living paranoid and stop having panic attacks. So when I stepped in as pastor of the church, panic was knocking on the door of my heart. And um, I was really concerned about the finances. We, we had started having services, you know, every week. I was like believing God for a sermon every week. I'd get up on this stage, still do oftentimes. And I'm like, Lord, if you don't show up, <laughs> Lord, I need you to show up. God, I, have you ever been there before? Am I the only one in the room that's like, God, I need you to show up right now. I can't do this on my own. And so that's, that's for those several weeks, several months, I was like, Lord. And then I started looking at our finances and I was on this roller coaster of emotions because I could just hear the enemy knocking on the door saying, this thing's not gonna last. You're gonna have to close this down. You're gonna have to stop this. You're gonna have to shut this. The vision's not gonna happen. Those dreams in your heart that you have of future campuses, future churches that you guys are called to build. It's never going to happen. I could just hear the enemy knocking on the doors of my heart, trying to get me to doubt God. I think one of the biggest reasons why we try to get ahead of God or, or become control freaks when it comes to how we live our lives is number one, we glorify doubt. We glorify the doubts that we start to hear. We give more power to doubt than doubt actually has. Like the devil is not that big. A fog that sits over a city a fog that covers an eight block, like, an, like a, a fog that would cover miles and miles of a city can actually fit into an eight ounce glass of water. That fog is basically an eight ounce glass of water that's been poofed up into the sky to make it look like it's really big, but it's not that big at all. But oftentimes we make our doubts bigger than they actually are. We make Goliath out to be bigger than he actually is. He's not just nine feet tall, he's 20 feet tall. He's impenetrable. There's no way that we could have children. There's no way that God could solve this problem with my son. You need to stop giving so much power to the doubts in your life and start giving power back to where it comes from. He is the head of the church. He is supreme over cancer, over divorce, over leukemia, over Down syndrome, over uh, not being able to get pregnant, over not being able to pay the bills, over the big college tuition that you've got to pay off. Whatever it is that's staring you in the face, you've got to remind yourself, my God is bigger than my doubts. I love what Acts 17 verse 26 says. It says, from one man, he made all the nations. Isn't it amazing that God like took dust from the ground and he was like this, you know, starts rubbing the dust around and God forms a man. Like that's, that's the Bible. God made man out of dust. And from one man, he made all the nations. God knows how to make something out of nothing. You say, Paul, I'm down to nothing. Good news. God's up to something. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean he's not working. He's working behind the scenes. Isaiah 45 says, and our God, I love this, verse 15, Isaiah 45, clearly you are a God who works behind the scenes. He's working behind the scenes. Y'all don't know it, but there's people back here right now behind the scenes. We don't see it all, but they're the ones that are making all of this happen. And this is where God often sits in your life. And you don't see when he's doing something, but I'm telling you, he's behind the scenes. He's working something together for good. He's causing all things to come together for good. God knows how to make something out of nothing. Clearly, God is working behind the scenes. Now watch what he says in Acts 17. Acts 17, he says, one man, you made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times. Everybody say appointed times. There is a set time for your promotion. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, do not grow weary in well-doing for at the proper time, at the appointed time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. 
When I was 19 years old, I was sitting in Oral Roberts University in a chapel, and I had this vision of preaching on the stage. I had not preached on, hard, on really any stages. And I was like, this is, this is not from God. This is selfish ambition, or this is weird because I don't want to do this. But I had this vision of preaching on that stage. And I heard God begin to speak to me, Paul, I want you to pastor ORU. And I was like, I'm not a chaplain. I can't pastor ORU. I'm not an RA. I have no title or position. I was a janitor. I was a janitor at ORU. I cleaned up people's nachos and, and trash. And, um, and God said, I want you to start serving. I, I said, God, I can't pastor. He said, I didn't ask you to preach. I asked you to pastor. And I said, okay. I hear what you're saying, God. He said, I want you to just love people, pray for people, minister to people, keep your dorm room open. If somebody needs a hug, give them a hug. If someone needs prayer, give them prayer. If somebody needs a ride to Taco Bell at midnight to get a cheesy gordita crunch, go get them a cheesy gordita crunch. Sometimes all you need is prayer and Taco Bell. God's got this. Y'all are like, all right. <laughs> So that's what I began to do. I would stand at the back of the door during chapel and just shake hands and love on people, minister to people. One night I was running around the campus and I heard the Holy Spirit just speak to my heart. Run across the street. Now this building hadn't been built yet. There was just a, it was outside. This used to be a soccer field. We used to play soccer out here right next to the school and our church would meet in the Maybe Center. And, um, but we had just started construction on this building and so all there was was a concrete slab and you could see the open sky, stars, you could see the praying hands. There was no walls, no ceiling, no seats, no, uh, nothing like that. It was just a concrete stage and just everything was flat. And I ran over here, it was about 10 p.m. at night. I sit down on this stage and I'm looking at the praying hands, looking at the stars, and I hear God say, you're gonna preach on this stage every week one day. And I was like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not, you know. And God was like, yeah, you need to prepare for it. And I didn't know, but God was birthing a vision in me that wouldn't come to pass for another 10 years. It wasn't until 10 years later that it all started to make sense and God was bringing it back to memory. I had, I had to ask God to remove it. Sometimes when you have a vision that's so strong on your heart and it's not happening, it can make you depressed or it can make you a control freak and try to make it happen in your own timing. Everybody say, God's got this. I didn't know why. But God was birthing this vision and I started every week just ministering to the ORU students. Then when I graduated, I watched friends get up and preach on that stage. I didn't preach. And I said, God, I don't even wanna remember the vision about preaching up there because I just don't think it's gonna happen. Like, I just want you to remove it from me because it hurts as close friends of mine are going up there and preaching and, and, um, and I'm okay. Like, I don't even need to preach. Like, I'm all good. But it was like, God wouldn't let me let go of that vision. Have you ever been there before? All right, so I get a call 10 years later. At this time, I'm 28. I'm stepping into pastor our church, and I got a call. Hey, Paul, we want you to come and preach at an ORU chapel. Tears started coming down my eyes, and I heard God say, I told you so. I've got this. And I remember just standing there, and I tell you this because sometimes we doubt if God's got it. We doubt if God can do it. One time, one of our kids got really sick, and it scared me because I was seeing things I didn't like. They were acting, they were behaving in a way that was really scaring me as a father. One of our sons, and this was about three years ago, and I had to preach that same weekend that I was battling the fear and the doubt that was trying to creep in about my child, our kid. And I remember during those times just coming back to a place of prayer. Again, prayer displaces paranoia. Prayer displaces panic. There have been times where I've been so concerned where I start breathing heavy like <laughs> and y'all are like, please, you're giving me a panic attack right now. <laughs> have you ever been there before where you're just so overwhelmed? And that's where I was. I was so overwhelmed. Man, I think about Jehoshaphat in the Bible. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat was so overwhelmed, all he knew to do in this moment was lay face down in front of all the people. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Lord, I don't know what to do, but I believe you've got this. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. And sure enough, God showed up. God healed our son. 
God showed up for Jehoshaphat. God showed up for the disciples in the middle of the storm, and God's going to show up for you. He's not forgotten about the dreams he's placed in your heart. He's not forgotten about the, the things you've prayed and you've wept. God sees you. He hears you. He knows you. He's called you. He's not forgotten about you. Stop giving so much power to the doubts. Number two, what holds us back from embracing God's got this? Comparison. We start looking at other people who are further ahead of us. We start looking at other people's lives and we're like, God, now I'm not glorifying doubt. I'm glorifying other people's stories. As if their story tells me that God's more for them than he is for me. Just because God's blessing someone else right now doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan to bless you. Just because God's given one girl her husband doesn't mean he doesn't plan to give you your husband. Just because God has helped one person beat a sickness or disease doesn't mean he's not planning to do it for you too. Just because God gave your coworker a promotion and a bonus doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan to bless your finances as well. It may not look like their story. And this is where we've got to escape the need to have it look just like somebody else's story. Your story is unique. Your gifts are unique. God sees you and he says, I've got something special for you. Get your eyes off of everyone else's stories and start owning your story. God's got this. He's got something great for you, something special for you. Expect a miracle. Number three, and I want the keys to come out. Number three, what holds us back oftentimes is despising the process. You see, God's got this, but it's going to be a process. God's got this, but it's going to be a process. Zechariah 4 verse 10 says, Do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So a couple weeks ago, we started putting in the footers for our new building that we're building here as a church. And I went out there with my phone and I captured footage of the big crane coming and driving the steel down into the ground. Now, no one's going to see that steel because they're cutting it off and it's footers, it's beneath the ground. But I got so excited, I was smiling, I was jumping, and I was going, God, thank you, the work is beginning. I think oftentimes we don't celebrate until we see a finished product. When God's saying, can you learn how to enjoy the process along the journey of progress before you reach the finished product? Some of us are waiting till everything's perfect, till we finally receive the full doctor's report that we're healed, till we finally get married, till we finally have children. Like right now, Ashley is pregnant with our fourth baby, due any second. And I like to put my ear next to her belly, and I like to listen to the progress that's developing on the inside. Because it's just a matter of time before that progress is delivered. And I think in your life, I hear the sound of progress. I can hear it. I hear the sound of. I hear the sound of something that's growing on the inside of you. God's growing you. Who you're becoming is more important than what you're doing. Who you're becoming is more important than how fast you see the, the accelerated breakthrough and blessings. You say, but Paul... I haven't gotten to the stage yet. I haven't taken off yet. Yeah, but you greeting at those back doors. You picking up people's trash. You learning to forgive and smile. You enjoying the journey. That's so much more beautiful than you just being on the stage. The stage is going to be nice one day, but that's not really what it's about. Enjoy the progress. So I posted a, a video this last week because I was working on a song. I've been working on a song called Victory. Victory. I think it's going to be a hit song. <laughs> for this church. And uh, I finished, I only had one thought about it and I was like, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna erase that video. This is how songwriters are. We'll start to write something, we don't like it, we scribble it, we take the piece of paper, we throw it in the trash can. I do this sometimes, I'm writing a book and I get so frustrated because I just can't get the words perfect and so I just stop or I delete it. And I heard God say, stop deleting the progress. Stop deleting the progress. Start posting the process. And I was like, post the process? 
And he said, you wait to post a song until it's perfect. I want you to post it in the seed form. Celebrate the seed. Celebrate the beginning. Celebrate the initial progress. Stop despising what it looks like right now. Just because it's not pretty yet doesn't mean it's not going to be a hit. So I'm going to show you the seed this morning of a song that I think has some potential in the future. Because I want to birth something in you today. Check this out. All right, now cut this video, and I want you to show the video of us with our band. I, I got together with some of our songwriters. I said, I need your help. I want you to start thinking of some ideas for this. So if you got those videos, show that. All right, so I know y'all are like, what? It's not even a full song. What I'm trying to show you is sometimes we don't want to show the initial process and the progress because it's not the perfect product yet. And what God's saying is we're living in a day and age where the world just wants to know, is the church willing to be authentic in the path of progressing towards who God's called them to be. Can the church stop just putting on a mask and acting like everything's fine and perfect? No, 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 I'm in a process and I'm okay with you seeing the gaps. Like I've been growing in front of y'all the last five years. Y'all have put up with my immaturities. Thank you so much. But I just want you to have permission to post the process, to stop despising the current season you're in. You go, but Paul, I'm a janitor. I'm not on the stage yet. I'm, I'm picking up people's trash. I'm in college. It hasn't happened yet. I haven't seen the breakthrough. Paul, I mean, I hear his story that he got healed of sickness. I don't have that story. I see his story that he got set free from his addiction, but I'm still battling this addiction. You know what? God's pleased to see you even showing up to church, that you are even here leaning in, saying, I'm contending to get free of some things. I'm believing that God's not finished with me on some stuff. I'm believing God's going to bring a healing in my family. See, God loves to see the work begin. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 says, for the still, the vision awaits. It's appointed time. Everybody say it's a set time. If God was to tell you all the dates that something was going to happen, it wouldn't require faith. So what do we do? I told you the three things that hold us back. Here's what we do. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says this. This is the answer right here. This is kind of the pinnacle scripture. Therefore, since, no, we do not want you to become lazy. So don't be lazy. Believing that God's got this doesn't mean that I just sleep all my life every day. It means I'm gonna do my part, but I'm gonna believe what's out of my control, God's going to bring to pass in his timing. We don't want you to become lazy, but imitate those who through faith, everybody say faith and patience inherit what has been promised say faith and patience faith and patience faith and patience get your snap out yeah stay in sync right there stay in sync not the band in sync like actually yeah yo 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 faith and patience faith faith Faith, faith, to patience. To faith, to patience. To faith, to patience. To faith, to patience. Faith and patience. Yo, faith and patience. Yo, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little ridiculous. Faith is believing in something that I haven't seen yet. Patience is trusting that God knows when the promises are supposed to happen.
I got a phone call this week that just really surprised me. I was like, what? And it was a real positive thing. And it just reminded me, it was like God was whispering through the phone call, I told you, I've got this. And I was like, I guess you do. I knew you did, but it's always nice to know that you do. In the moments when I'm questioning if you did, somebody say, God's got this. Faith is believing even when you don't see. The opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty. It's thinking you know it all or you have to know it all, that you got it all figured out, you're for certain. But faith is saying, even when I don't know, even when I can't see, I believe you're working behind the scenes. I believe you're causing things to turn around in my son's life, in my daughter's life, in my marriage, in my health, in their marriage, in that situation. God, I'm not going to try to control their situation. I can't control it. I'm going to trust that God's got this. God's got him and God's got her and God's got them and God's got us and God's got this church and God's got that church and God's got this pastor and God's got that pastor. God's got all of us. God's got the whole world in his hands. So this is what happened when Elisha, he was wrestling with fear and doubt when his servant came to him or his servant was wrestling with fear and doubt and said, Elisha, what are we going to do? We're surrounded by enemy armies. They woke up one morning and there was enemy armies all around them. And the, and, and the servant came to Elisha and said, we're going to die. Well, this, is, this, is, this is the end of the road. And Elisha says to his servant in 2 Kings chapter 6, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Have faith in God. Don't be afraid. Squeeze someone's hand right now and say, God's got this. Someone needs to hear this right now. I just feel like I'm preaching to someone online. I don't know what you're facing. But God's got this. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I want to show you a video from the night that I stepped in as pastor because I was so overwhelmed with emotions and I had all these thoughts about the future and I didn't know what was going to happen and I know we're only five years in but five years is a good chunk of time it's a good chunk of time to say God's got this so I want you to see this and then I want to bring it to a close goodness of God. I'm just, I love you too. And he's been faithful. He's been so faithful. He's been so faithful. Eight months old next week and growing we plan on having more babies, more kids to grow up in this church. <laughs> but like mom said, it's... You know, I like, I like the beginning of something. I like the end of something. It's the middle that's hard. And you're going through the middle sometimes and you're like, God, are you there? Do you care? Are things going to turn around here? Are we going to see some breakthrough? And unintentionally, you... There's so much to this whole message. One of the antidotes that can combat fear, anxiety, panic, worry, stress, or even just a frustration or comparison trap, one of the antidotes is gratitude. Looking around and going, wow, I don't deserve any of this. God, you've been so faithful. You've been so good. God, you've carried me this far. And I know you're going to keep on carrying me forward. So Elisha prayed for his servant because his servant was freaking out. His servant had forgotten about all the other miracles because in this moment, all he could see was the enemies. And Elisha said, I pray, Lord, that you would open his eyes so that he can see that there are more with us than those that are against us. And in that moment, the Lord opened 
the servant's eyes and he looked up and he saw the hills and he saw it full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha and he realized this is God the God of angel armies has showed up on our behalf God delivered them from that moment this is what Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians he said and I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that you would know the hope to which God has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority power and dominion every name that is invoked not only in the present age but in the one to come and God placed all things everybody say all things the thing you're facing right now, it is under his feet. I'm walking in victory. The devil is under my feet. That is theological. That is straight. That is strong. You can stand on it. It's under God's feet. And if God lives inside of you, it's under your feet. And he is the head over everything. Yes, he is the head over the church. And Paul went on to say in Ephesians 3 verse 14. Go to that one. He said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. I love this from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that being rooted and established in love, you would have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. Hey, Jesus loves you. I sing this song to my kids. Almost every week, I'll say, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Because he loves you, he's got this. When you realize he loves you, he loves your son, he loves your daughter, he loves you, he loves your family, he loves your marriage, he loves your parents, he loves what he's put on the inside of you, he cares about you. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you would be filled in the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can hope, ask, dream, or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Yes, praise and glory. Glory be to the head of the church, Jesus Christ, throughout all generations. And Romans 8, dear church, if God is for us, who can be against us? And what can separate us from the love of God? Yes, I know. He says this in Romans 8, verse 35. Verse 35, he says, shall trouble or hardship, shall persecution or famine, shall nakedness or danger or sword. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Stand to your feet all over this place. Just shout it out. God's got this. I was at ORU in 2007, my senior year. The school was about to shut down. And someone I was talking to last night reminded me of this because he said, Paul, I'm facing a situation where I need to believe that God's got this. He said, I'm facing something that's bigger than me. It's bigger than the group that I'm a part of. And we need God to intervene. I said, that's what I'm preaching on this weekend. God's got this. And um, he said, do you remember when your dad stepped in as the interim president at ORU? I said, yeah, that was my senior year. He said, did you know ORU was $52 million in debt? So we had heard phrases at ORU like expect a miracle, something good is going to happen to you. But in that moment, it was hard. Doubt was all over the campus. There was fear. There was this, this resentment, this anger, and people didn't know what to do. Confusion. People were going, well, if we could just go to this university or that university. But God had a special story for this university, and he still does. It's incredible what God's done. But during that time, my dad stepped in as the interim president for Oral Roberts University, and he gets a phone call from the Green family. They had no one in their family that went to ORU, but they heard what was going on and God began to stir their hearts. God's about to move on people's hearts that don't even know you to be a part of helping you in your situation. You see, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, 
But while he was down in the den, the king was praying for him. Daniel didn't even know it. The king was fasting for him. Daniel couldn't shut the mouths of the lions. All he knew to do was to sleep and trust that God was taking care. While you go to sleep, God goes to work. God began to shut the mouths of lions as Daniel began to sleep and trust that God's got this. So my dad, he was trying to sleep, but panic and worry was knocking on the door of his heart. And he didn't want to be the guy that had to tell all the student body that the university was closing its doors. But he gets a phone call from the Green family. They said, we want to help. He said, if you're going to help, you need to help this week because we have a board meeting and it's about to shut down. We're $52 million in debt. And this looks like the end, but I have faith that God can do something. God can do a miracle. God used the Green family to give $70 million to get ORU out of debt. It was an incredible testimony. Today, ORU is in the best place it's ever been financially. The best days are right here, right now. Keep getting better. But during that time, I heard God say this. I can use anyone from anywhere. Don't think that they are the source. They're not the source. They're not the savior. It is God who works through people to bring. He's working all things together for good. He's working behind the scenes. Some of you are believing for a breakthrough in your finances. How many of you are believing for God to do something on your behalf? And you, you, this sermon was for you. You're saying, yeah, I, I'm facing some things where I just need to be reminded God's got this. Could be for your family, could be in your health, could be for your finances, could be for a ministry, a dream that God placed in your heart. And you're wondering, when is it going to happen? God's got it. He's got set times. He's got appointed times. Keep on trusting. Keep on believing. By faith and patience, you will see the promises of God come to pass. If this was for you and God was speaking directly to you, I want you to leave your seat. Come down to this altar. You need to bring fear. You need to bring control. You need to let go of trying to make it happen in your own timing. You need to try to stop worrying about it every night. If worry and panic has been messing with your mind lately, I want you to come down to this altar. If the, the desire to control things, make it happen in your own time, has been messing with you, I want you to come down to the altar. This is a release of control. You're saying, God, I trust that you've got this. 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 You've got this church. You've got me. You've got my family. You've got my health. You've got this situation. So God, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to learn how to sleep. I'm going to learn how to trust. I'm going to learn how to work, but believe that you're the one that brings the harvest. So I'm going to sow the seed and I'm going to celebrate the progress and I'm going to post the process. And I'm not going to wait till it's perfect to start shouting about it. I'm going to believe that even in the middle of the seasons that aren't easy, that what you're doing in me is more important than what's happening around me. What you're, God's birthing a new song in some of you. God's writing some new lyrics inside your story. And he's saying this song is going to be a song for other people to sing. Some of you are in a test right now. And God says if you pass this test, there's a testimony that people are going to sing about. They're going to look at your, your life and they're going to say, surely there is a God. God. This is what happened when Daniel was delivered from the mouths of the lions. When they pulled Daniel out, the entire empire that was around there, they were amazed that he wasn't eaten by the lions. Daniel was prime meat. He did the Daniel fast. He created the Daniel fast. Those lions should have eaten him. It did not make sense that Daniel didn't get eaten. God's about to do some things in your life that don't even make sense to the world. And they're going to say, surely Daniel's God is the real God. Surely there is a God. If he saved that marriage, surely there is a God. Stop acting like it's all in your hands. God's got this. He's got this. He's got this. And he's got that. And he's got you. And he's got them. And he's got her. He's got her. He's got her. He's got her. I don't know who I'm speaking to. There's a husband that needs to know he's got her. There's a dad that needs to know he's got her. 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 The Bible says, the enemy cannot snatch us from his hands. The devil cannot snatch you from the hands of God. Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, Satan, you don't even get the victory. No matter what, God's got this. My best days are still in front of me. 
no matter what happens, I'm going to get through this. There's nothing you're facing that you can't get through when you know who lives inside you. He's going to give you grace. He's going to give you favor. He's going to connect you to the right people. He's going to move on people's hearts that don't even know you to be a part of helping you. There's people praying for me that I don't even know all over the world. There's people praying for you that you don't even realize they are contending for you. The Bible says he intercedes on your behalf. He sits to the right hand of the Father and he intercedes day and night for you. You've got an intercessor prayer warrior in heaven that's going to town for you. You've got a great cloud of witnesses that's cheering you on. Heaven is on its feet. God's got this. You coming down to this altar is a seed into your destiny. I'm telling you, it's a seed into your destiny. And God never wastes a seed. God never wastes a seed. The seed of humility, the seed of saying, Lord, I surrender. God, I'm choosing to trust you. Lord, I'm choosing to humble myself under your authority. And I'm going to ask you to, Lord, you do it in your timing. Whatever it is that you're believing for, just say, God, you do it in your time. You do it in your time. Your time is better than my time. Father knows best. So, God, I'm going to trust you. He's a good father. I'm going to ask all of us all, all over this room just to close our eyes as we get ready to pray. I don't want to miss an opportunity to give you a chance to surrender to Jesus. If you're here right now and you want to repent of your sins and make Jesus your Lord and Savior, just raise your hand. Today's your day. You could join some all over this room. Yeah, heaven rejoices when one sinner repents and says, I'm ready to get things right with God. Today's my day. Yeah. Maybe you're watching online. Let's all pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I surrender. I'm all yours. I repent of sin and I receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you've got this, so I'm going to trust in you. My best days are still in front of me and I have victory because Jesus lives in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.